Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the um, October Plum Tree meeting. Um, tonight, we've myself and Julian are going to talk about the astronomy and the physics of the autumn sky. And um, Richard's going to talk afterwards on the Great Conjunction, which is coming up in December. So the aims of the first part of the evening are to describe some of the autumn constellations um, and identify some of the deep sky treasures within these. And Julian, our resident astrophysicist, is going to explore the physics of some of these and we're also going to show some amateur images of them. Um, and one of the aims is really to encourage you all to go out there and get looking up. So if we think about what the definition of a constellation is, it's a, a group of stars forming a recognisable pattern that's traditionally named after its apparent uh, form, so what um, the shape it makes, um, or identified uh, with a mythological feature. Now, if we think of constellations and we ask people what, what they would think of, Orion would be a, a, a common one. And here I've got an image of uh, Orion and superimposed outlined where the main stars are. You see Betelgeuse up here, big yellow orangey star, and Rigel down here, a bright blue one, and then the belt and the sword of Orion. Now, technically, this isn't the whole constellation. This is just an asterism. This is the, um, the pattern that people easily recognize um, as, as, as the name, as, as Orion. But the constellation of Orion is actually um, a much bigger area, includes a, a lot of other stars that we don't always think about. He, he's holding his club or sword um, above it with his right arm and with his left arm here he's uh, holding a shield and there are lots of other stars um, in the constellation. Now constellations and, and patterns in the sky have been recognized for um, thousands of years and they think drawings like this cave drawing uh, represents uh, a depiction of the sky uh, and it's probably over 17,000 years old and they think the stars here represent the Hyades uh, and the stars here the Pleiades and then we, we, we'd recognize this today as, as Taurus the bull. Um, but over the years hundreds of different constellation patterns um, built up and everyone had their own patterns and um, in the early part of the 20th century, the International Astronomical Union was born um, and their, their role was to facilitate work between astronomers from different countries and also to promote the study of astronomy. And one of their first tasks was to break up the, dis break up the sky into 88 defined constellations. And that's what this publication is all about, um, drawing boundaries uh, between the exact stars. Uh, that, so they haven't always been uh, as tightly rigorous as we've seen, and there have been many constellations that have come and gone. And this is one of the bigger ones. This is called Argo Navis, which was, uh, I think, originally defined by Ptolemy, or at least it goes way, way back. So this constellation represents um, Jason and the Argonauts, their ship, the Argo. Uh, you can see it's there. It's quite a, a big thing. And uh, it encompassed quite a lot of stars. So when they came around to um, uh, standardizing on constellations, this was really too big. And I think it was actually broken up before then. But uh, it uh, was separated into at least three constellations. So we can now see here the three constellations. So uh, the, the big one, Argo Navis, which was the uh, Jason the Argonauts uh, ship, has now been broken up into Carina, which is the keel of the ship, Pupis, the poop deck of the ship, or the stern part, and Vela, the sails. So this is much more manageable, and uh, it's much easier also to tell people where to look. So if you say you want to look in Carina, then you've got a much tighter area of sky to focus in on, rather than uh, the whole of Argo, which uh, covered a large um swath of the sky that was really just too unwieldy. 
and interestingly, Julian, I, I've read today that the uh, one of the drivers for the constellations uh, was the variable stars, the, the work of people picking up variable stars, and they needed to name them uniformly. Um, so, um, beta. Um, um, Orionis. Yes. <laughs> so the, the, yeah. the, that was one of the, the, the main drivers at the time. So our first constellation we're going to look at tonight um, is Andromeda. So um, Andromeda, all of these constellations are ones that will be visible at about half nine um, currently in the sky. I thought I thought um, half nine, it's reasonably dark. Um, and if you've got youngsters, you can still get out maybe and look up. So and Andromeda, um, she was in mythology the daughter of Cassiopeia, and she was chained um, to a rock to be eaten by Cetus, the sea monster, uh, but she was saved by Perseus, knight in shining armor. And Andromeda isn't a particularly distinctive um, constellation, uh, unless you know what you're looking for. Uh, you can see here there's um, four main stars which make up her body and then a belt. Um, the the um, principal star is this star here, uh, Alpha Rats, and uh, you can see on the right here it's also a, a star which features in the square of Pegasus and in times gone by the, the star was um, in both Andromeda and Pegasus, but now it, it belongs to Andromeda. And Pegasus just borrows it for the um, to make the square. Um, and one of the interesting things about Andromeda is if um, you can see her in the night sky and follow up this belt, uh, you come to um, a fuzzy thing in the sky, which is M31 or the um, Andromeda galaxy. And here's a an amateur photo from our own Gareth Davies of M31 um, and it's got these satellite galaxies here and here um, and M31 is actually very big so this is a composite picture um, which was on astronomy picture of the day uh, so that's a big um, recognition of um, how good an image is and this is a composite image by these two chaps who gave me permission to use this. And this shows the, the real size of the Andromeda galaxy in the sky versus the full moon. And if the full moon is about half a degree across, you can see it takes about six full moons to cover the same area uh, as, Andro as the Andromeda galaxy. So it is a massive feature in the sky. But because these edges are very faint, all we ever really see is this central core which is what we see as a faint fuzzy glow. Um, and one of the best ways to view this is with binoculars. Um, and you can get a good idea. With, with most telescopes, the, the magnification is so strong, you only see this core. Uh, Andromeda being the closest galaxy of a decent size to us, and uh, there are really only three main galaxies in our location of space, our own Milky Way, Andromeda and the Triangulum. Andromeda um, is the furthest thing you can see with the naked eye. It's about two million light years away. And for that reason, it's been extensively studied by uh, astronomers because, um, you know, it's, it's the nearest example of a good sized galaxy that you can see with enough detail. We can see individual stars in it with the uh, high powered telescopes now. And uh, we can get quite a lot of uh, information, but if you can see the stars, you can see how they move and you can get some idea of the structure. So that it's been particularly uh, heavily studied more recently, this uh, this picture here, the Panandromeda Archaeological Survey, or PANDAS, because we love our acronyms in astronomy. So they have mapped pretty much the whole of uh, Andromeda in very high detail. I think we were actually thinking at uh, one point uh, of printing this out into a huge piece of paper and putting it across the car park in physics. But uh, like many other things, that's been uh, put on hold now. Uh, but you can see there, there's quite a lot of detail, including a, a giant stream there of stars that are coming into it. 
one other interesting thing is it has a, a you know a, a large central core which uh, was a bit uh, James was pointing out but in the case of Andromeda unlike the Milky Way which really just has one central core this one has two cores uh, and we can see a picture on the left there of the two cores uh, the the brighter one is um, not actually the center the less bright one with a black spot on is the one with the gigantic black hole uh, at the very center of it and nobody's quite sure what the other one is there's some idea that it might be a cluster of stars going around the black hole or something else but uh, you know there's there still stuff to be done even with our closest uh, neighbor and i say it's about two million light years away so if anybody's sitting on andromeda and looking at us now uh, they're seeing us at the very dawn of uh, the time humans were coming down from the trees uh, and walking out onto the savannah for the very first time. So quite quite a uh, a thought there if you look up uh, and see it. And if you're in a really, really dark sky, you can actually see it with the naked eye. But um, I have to say, I've never managed that. I don't know if you have, James. I get a, a hint of it. Um, I don't think my eyesight's getting better. Oh, mine. So on, our next constellation is Cassiopeia. Um, this is the mother of um, Andromeda. Um, she uh, boasted her unrivaled beauty, and she was the king, the wife of King uh, Cepheus. And Cassiopeia is a, a very common uh, constellation that, that lay people know that the W in the sky, and you can see this W here, um, doesn't really represent the the image of a person, but artists have over the years drawn pictures on, on top of this W. Uh, and you can see on the right here, there's the constellation of Cassiopeia and she's next to her husband and Andromeda, the daughter, is below. Um, there are, oh, oh yes, there's lots of interesting things um, in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And what this image shows, this is an image I took some years ago of the um, the Milky Way um, across the across our sky, uh, and you can see I've tried to highlight the stars of Cassiopeia, and you can see they um, she appears in the depths of the Milky Way, and below her you can just make out that the in the green dot that's the, the Andromeda galaxy and the stars that make up. Andromeda herself. Now one of the popular targets for astrophotographers in Constellation is the Bubble Nebula. Um, it's, it's a pretty impressive structure um, and this is a, a lovely one from Nick Simanek who again gave me permission to use the image tonight uh, and Julian's going to tell us a bit about the Bubble Nebula. Right, so the Bubble Nebula is uh, an emission nebula, which kind of means it's shining light rather than absorbing light. And it's formed, uh, in this case, by the gas uh, that forms stars. So uh, stars are formed when big clouds of gas get cold enough that they, they sort of shrink together and collapse. And uh, you know, then eventually light up and get very hot. So a star is formed in a big bubble of gas and uh, there's a big concentration, obviously, in the centre where the star forms. But then when it lights up, you get a lot of radiation pushing out. And this is what you're seeing now, that this big bubble is being created in space by this star that's now lit up and shining out and illuminating the bubble and pushing it outwards. So uh, that, that's kind of why it's uh, shining. It's being lit from within by the star. It's a very hot central star about 44 times the mass of the uh, sun. And this is what's heating the bubble. Very early on in stars' life, they often give off a lot of ultraviolet radiation. So that very um, energetic radiation, which is why you're seeing this lit up very well. It's very good at lighting up, particularly hydrogen. So uh, that's what we see with the emission nebula, which uh, is slightly different to some other nebulas that uh, we, we can find in the night sky. It's, it's quite an impressive structure, isn't it? 
Oh, it is, yeah. yeah. You can re- almost see there a sort of like a football shape because it will be a three-dimensional shape all around that star. Mm. Brilliant. Right. What do we so, have next? Um, Cepheus, so King Cepheus, husband of Cassiopeia, father of Andromeda. Um, and again, it's difficult to... Um, see how they got a person from this it looks like an upside down house um, and in the night sky it often does look like a, a square house with a with a pointy roof um, it's the, the brightest star is this um, older amin down here the alpha star um, and it's a, a a region again a very popular region for uh, astrophotographers to um, search because there's lots of interesting deep sky objects such as the iris nebula and the wizard nebula and the elephant's trunk and again i read today the dormouse cluster which i've not heard of before um, and it is a very small cluster um, it's very near the north celestial pole so um, it's is visible throughout the whole year as it rotates around the North Celestial Pole. And like Cassiopeia, it, it, it's circumpolar. So throughout the year, you, you're able to see this constellation. Now, the Elephant Trunk Nebula, um, this is, again, um, one of our society members' images, Lee's. Um, this is a hydrogen alpha image of the Elephant Trunk Nebula. And this is meant to depict um, the elephant's trunk. Can you see that? Visualize that. Um, and again, here, here's the, the the alpha star, Alderamin, um, and there's this um, gas cloud, uh, and the elephant's trunk is just part of that in the center. Um, and it also labels the garnet star, which is well, the garnet star is you know, quite interesting. Uh, so it's a red supergiant. So this is uh, much bigger than our own sun. In fact, it's uh, about 19 times the mass of our sun. And the thing about big stars is they don't last very long. They burn their fuel very, very quickly. So this one has already gone through the main sequence where it burns hydrogen to helium, which is what our sun's doing. So for our sun, that lasts about 10 billion years. For this one, this is probably only 10 million years old and it's already got through most of its fuel. So it's into its second wave where it turns. Um, so the first wave is burning hydrogen to helium. That's quite an efficient reaction. Second wave is a little more desperate where you're burning helium to carbon. And that usually gives you about another 10%. So if it's been going for about 10 million years, it's probably got another million years burning um, helium to carbon. And then uh, that it does get uh, quite desperate after that. There's not a lot left for it to burn. So uh, it's really, really big, though, uh, and probably about 100,000 times brighter than the sun. So uh, partly because of its huge size, it's about 2,000 light years away. and. Uh, it's not particularly hot. It's about three and a half thousand uh, Kelvin or degree centigrade, if you prefer. It doesn't make much difference of those. Whereas our sun is about six thousand, so it's about half the, the temperature of that, which is why it looks red rather than sort of a whitish colour. And as I said, it's really quite big. So this is uh, how big it is. Mu Cephei is another of its names, but you can see there a picture of it right next to the solar system and. Uh, you might be able to make out Mars there. So it's bigger than the orbit of Mars. So if you plonked it in the uh, centre of our solar system, it would certainly consume Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, and possibly even Jupiter. So it's a, it's a huge thing. And it will go bang fairly soon, which uh, in astro astronomical terms is next half a million years or so, probably, and uh, will almost certainly turn into a black hole at that point. So one to look out for if you're plan to live a, a long healthy life and and when it goes bang what will it leave a planetary nebula or 
No, this this will explode violently into a supernova type two no. uh, reaction. So we have a very bright flash which will last for, uh, I guess, uh, a month or two, mm. and then there will just be a black hole there and a ring of debris expanding out. So a, a little like uh, the bubble nebula, but uh, a much more extreme version because uh, it will be lit up much, uh, a, a lot brighter. But 2,000 light years, we'll probably be able to we'll certainly be able to see it um, from the Earth. I don't think, I mean, probably won't be able to see it during the day, but uh, it, it would certainly be quite bright at night. And you, you say when it goes, it will leave a ring of debris. Why, yes. why not a globe or a well, sphere? It, it will, will be a globe, but right. uh, you, you tend to see the edges. Um, the, the edges tend to be thicker rather than the yeah. stuff coming straight towards you. Right. So it gets picked out much, much easier. Right. All right. What do we have next? Ah. Cygnus the Swan. Excellent. So this is um, probably really a, a, a summer constellation, but Cygnus is still hanging around um, in the southwest uh, as you look out in the evening. Um, and it, what, the principal star is. Deneb in the tail of the swan. Um, this is the alpha star. And Deneb forms um, part of the, the summer triangle with Vega, which is here and here, and Altair, which is down here. And I think the next, yeah. So again, here's another um, wide field shot of uh, looking south um, of the Milky Way. And you can see Deneb's up here and uh, Vega here and Altair down here. And this is a summer triangle. Um, and I've zoomed in on the other image of the uh, Milky Way. And again, the red circles show um, summer triangle, Deneb, Vega and Altair. And then Cygnus, the swan, the constellation goes into this. Um, sort of transects the this rift in the Milky Way, uh, and the wings are coming out, and the bodies um, heading forwards, and the star. Go on, Julian. Flying straight down the Milky Way, it is. Yes, uh, and the the we might have to go back a slide. So this star, which is the eye of the Swan, is Alberio. And yeah, what a visual uh, sort of treat this is. It looks like sort of two jewels right next to each other. So we're not really sure. Well, it's certainly two stars. You can see that there's a, a blue one and a yellow one. Uh, but it's quite possibly, well, it's almost certainly three stars. I think the uh, yellow one is a double star. And there have even been suggestions that the blue might be a double, but I think that's now uh, uh, less certain. And we're not even sure if they're connected. They're obviously quite close together, but whether they are gravitationally bound, whether this is a binary system or even a trinary system, we're not entirely sure. The uh, the yellow one is a um, is a K class star. So if you remember O B A F G M, yeah, <laughs> I think I remember. So. Uh, K, K is somewhere down, it's a bit hotter than uh, the G star, which is our own. Uh, but the B star is a very hot one. So O is the hottest and B is the next. So that's why it's bright blue and uh, really quite strong. Very worthwhile looking at because uh, you, they appear to be just a, a single star uh, if you just view it normally. But uh, with a small telescope, you can see the two. Mm. And a fantastic thing uh, it is to see too. Yeah. A real yeah. showcase. The other yes, thing so to say about uh, Cygnus is that Cygnus is where the Kepler Space Telescope was pointing for most of its mission, and that is where we found uh, this huge number of uh, exoplanets, planets around other stars. So Kepler's found, I think, two and a half thousand confirmed planets, and probably another thousand or so that are probably planets when we get around to looking at them. So they're all within Cygnus, just that small constellation. And, and if you look on Stellarium and you um, 
get Stellarium to highlight exoplanets. Um, there's a massive cluster around here, and it oh. make, makes you think um, all the exoplanets are here, but it's just a sampling um, thing. Right. I didn't know Stellarium could do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and with, with Alberio, if, if you look at it with binoculars or a small telescope, um, you can't always tell there's a, a, a colour difference. But if you take the, the stars out of focus a little, um, they bloat and get bigger, and then the colour can become more obvious. Um, so you'll see a, um, an orangey yellow uh, ball and a bluer ball. Um, so that can often help determine the colour of stars. So our next constellation is um, Delphinius, the dolphin. Um, this is one of the smaller constellations out of the 88 um, constellations in the sky. Apparently it's 69th out of 88. Do you know what the smallest constellation is, Julian? Oh, I don't know. It's me. It, I'm sorry. Is it uh, one of the dogs? Uh, no, it's Crux. Crux? Oh, yeah. that's... Southern Hemisphere. Oh, OK. Um, so um, Delphinius is it's a little triangle with a tail. Um, and actually, this is quite a nice little constellation to look at. Um, again, I've used that image and you can just make out, it's like a little kite, really. Um, and the stars are third and fourth magnitude. Um, and so if you can see this, then your eyesight's reasonable um, and the light pollution wherever you are is um, tolerable. Um, oh. it, it's, a, it's a nice little thing to see um, just to the left of the summer triangle. So again, Deneb, uh, Vega and Altair. So if you can see the summer triangle, look to the left about a third from the bottom and look for this little, um, looks like a kite. Um, and there's several um, deep sky objects um, in this constellation, even though it's quite small. And one of them is this um, beautiful globular cluster called NGC um, 6934. So what do we know about globular clusters? Uh, this, I don't know where this one is. I just uh, picked this up from the Hubble site. So a globular cluster is a big collection of stars very very dense so you know where we are the average distance between stars is a few light years like four or five light years i think within a globular cluster it's it's much less than that probably even less than a light year so if you are living on a planet uh, in a globular cluster you might um, you know, all the stars would be much that much closer and uh, you, you have a very different uh, picture of the night sky than than you do here. They're certainly one of the oldest structures. They have some of the oldest stars that we can find. And one of the uh, problems with them is we don't really know how they're made. We're not quite sure if they are formed uh, like this, probably early on, just collapsing a bit like galaxies do. They have a different structure to galaxies uh, in some ways. If, if you quantify them with certain parameters, they don't really fit in the galactic uh, sort of sequence. Uh, and uh, the other issue is because you've got all these stars very close to each other, why don't they just all collapse down to uh, you know, perhaps a black hole or something in, in the center? And the, the reason we think is perhaps they do eventually collapse down to uh, almost nothing, but it will take a long while. And the reason is uh, as the stars sort of pass by each other, they give each other kicks. So you get a big star passing by a little star, they sort of trade energy and uh, the, the big star may kick the little star quite hard and the little star sort of moves to uh, the outer uh, reaches of the globular cluster and the bigger star has to go in, inwards. But there it meets lots of other big stars and they sort of all exchange energy and they, they keep uh, kicking each other. Uh, so as, as they sort of slowly fall towards the centre, they keep getting booted back up and uh, not doing that. But I think, uh, from what I've heard, the writing is on the wall that uh, in a few billion years, they will all collapse down to uh, not very much. But uh, they've done very well so far. They've been going for 13 billion years or so. So 
So uh, they'll they'll probably keep going. Uh, another thing is that uh, we say we think of them as really old um, structures with very old stars in them, but that isn't always the case. This is um, some science that's been done really recently. This is the Slug Survey, which is the Sages Legacy Unifying Globulars and Galaxies Survey. Uh, and SAGES is another acronym, so we have an acronym within an acronym there. I'm not sure SAGES may even have an acronym within it. We do love our acronyms within astronomy. But anyway, what, what you can see here, uh, perhaps you can't, but uh, you can see some blue stars and some red stars. And they're actually, this is true of pretty much all the globular clusters we've looked at. They seem to split into these two components that there are some blue stars and some red stars. Red stars are typically very old, blue stars are, are more uh, recent. So there does seem something going on within these globular clusters that's perhaps making these new stars, or at least splitting them up. Uh, I think this is something that is still being worked on. But uh, say we used to think globular clusters were just full of very old stars, but that's slowly being uh, changed and altered as we uh, learn a little bit more about them. Right. And have we been able to detect the proper motion of stars within globular clusters? Oh yes, yes, that's that's certainly been done. You can even uh, chart them. You need a fairly good telescope because uh, as, as we saw, it's very crowded in there. So even mm. splitting up the stars and identifying a single star because they're so close together, they tend to, their light tends to overlap one onto another. <clears throat> So you need a, a good telescope with a, what's known as a good PSF, so that you, you can actually narrow the light down to a single star. And then uh, taking a spectroscopic views of them, you can, you can work out how they're moving. And uh, mm. that, is, that is another popular thing that people do with them. And, and the globular clusters we know about are all in, all in our galaxy. Oh, oh, there's plenty around Andromeda too. There's, uh, I think there's 100, 70 or something around Andromeda, so they've found a lot of those, and also around other more distant galaxies you can find mm -hmm. them. I mean, some of them are really, really bright. Um, Omega Centauri, which mm -hmm. uh, is in the Southern Hemisphere, that's that's actually almost too bright to be a globular cluster, and uh, they think there's some argument, but that uh, might come under a different categorization and be called an ultra-compact dwarf galaxy. Uh, so there's a you know, and we're still classifying these things. And are they all galactic in nature, or are there some which are in free space? Uh, all the ones I know about are uh, attached to galaxies. Right. But I'm not sure if that's completely the case. I, I'm not. You know, I'm not too sure at all. Right. The other thing is they uh, they tend to get gobbled up by galaxies. So uh, we know one one of these. Many of these have actually fallen through the galaxy at some point and come out the other side and lost stars to the galaxy as part of it, and will probably continue to do so. Ooh, fascinating. Yeah, and they're very pretty to look at through the telescope. Very pretty. So <clears throat> we've got another constellation, uh, Lyra, the Lyle, which is a small harp. Apparently, there's some very distinctive differences between a lyre and a harp. I'm... Do you know the differences? I do not know the differences. <laughs> no, that could be a talk for another day. Yes. Um, uh, the principal star here is is Vega. This is the Alpha Star. This is one of the brightest stars in the northern hemisphere. Um, a first order magnitude star, although its magnitude is uh, near closer to zero. Um, and in the summer months, uh, Vega is very bright and, and pretty much overhead. And uh, in the winter, it moves down much nearer the horizon. And um, Capella is the star, which is uh, pretty much overhead throughout the winter. Now, interestingly, Vega uh, was the pole star um, 14,000 years ago and will be again in um, 13,727 years. Right. Um, I'll put that in the calendar. So um, it'll only be about five degrees away from the celestial pole, um, unlike Polaris, which is uh, less than 
one degree at the moment. Um, uh, something uh, interesting about Vega is because it was always um, sort of visible from the northern hemisphere and very bright, it's been used as a, the basis of a magnitude system. So uh, often we categorize stars by how bright they are compared to Vega. So that's the Vega mag um, uh, magnitude system, which is a bit, uh, it, it works fairly well because uh, certainly in the early days you could always see Vega. So you could go and have a look at it with your telescope and then compare it to another star. But because its light output is, varies through the wavelengths, you know, it, it's, I think it's brighter in probably the red than the blue or something like that. It's not a very consistent one. So we've, we've moved on from the Vega system, although it's still used. Right. Um, and like most constellations, there's a number of deep sky targets. But here is, uh, with this green dot, represents M57. Uh, and before we get to that, again, I've made a little animated GIF here just to show this looks like an upside down kite um, just to the right of the Milky Way. And again, you can hear see Deneb, Vega and Altair. And there's here's the dolphin, Delphinius down here. And then um, Lyra is, is up here. And M57 is another very common target for the astrophotographer. Um, it's relatively easy. Must be if I've taken a picture of it. Um, and this is the Ring Nebula. And here we have uh, an animation from ESA of how a, a Ring Nebula forms or a, a planetary nebula, which uh, the Ring Nebula is part of. So it's sort of the death throes of a star, and our sun will go through one of these uh, phases. So what happens towards the end uh, of life of star like the sun is uh, it, it gets uh, quite extended, goes through this red giant phase where it gets much bigger, and then it starts to shed uh, gas and stuff comes off it. And then eventually it uh, collapses down to what's called a white dwarf, which gets very, very hot. And uh, then the radiation from this very hot thing lights up all this gas that's been shed earlier on. And we can see now uh, this uh, all this gas is lit up uh, we get another sort of emission type nebula almost. And they're called planetary nebulas, although they have nothing to do with planets or nebulas, uh, because earlier astronomers thought they might have something to do with planets, but uh, they, they don't. Uh, planetary nebulas are given off by stars, usually of anything up to about eight times the mass of the sun. So above eight times the mass of the sun, they, the stars explode towards the end of their life rather than giving off planetary nebulas. And they're quite a short-lived thing, probably only uh, 20,000 years, which is really short uh, in, in astronomy, uh, for any one of those to last. So where we normally talk millions or billions of years, these are just in the thousands of years. And there are about 1,500 of them known in the galaxy. Uh, so uh, yeah, but the Ring Nebula is particularly uh, easy to find, particularly in the summer, but uh, mm. I guess you can still find it now. Yeah, and, oh, uh, definitely. And it's very obvious when you find it. Yeah. Although it doesn't look quite as colourful as that to, to the naked eye. Well, not to the naked eye, but to the small telescope eye. No. Um, and the, the, the different shapes of planetary nebula is fascinating. Mm. Um, and there's lots of modelling work goes on that, isn't there? Uh, yeah, it kind of depends how it explodes, whether it sheds things sort of north and south or uh, completely symmetrical or or whatever. So yes, we have all sorts of them. Uh, some of them ringed like, some of them uh, sort of concentric circles, all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I've got, I've got a book, I've got my book ready on. Oh, wow. <laughs> that looks a very big book. <laughs> got lots of pretty pictures in. Oh, uh, wow. You've got all 1500 of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So I think that could be the end of our constellations. Right. Well, I hope you've uh, enjoyed our uh, brief tour through uh, the autumnal sky uh, and uh, that uh, you, you found something there to go and look for. Hopefully we'll get some nice clear nights to, uh, to look out at them and see if you can spot any of those constellations. Certainly some of them are easier than uh, others. Cygnus, uh, I think, is 
probably a nice easy one. The dolphin might be a little harder, but uh, you know, go go out and give it a go. So I hope we inspired some of you to go out and uh, look up those things. So now we'd like to hand you over to Richard, who's got uh, details of the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that's going to come up uh, later on this year. Thank you to Julian and James for that. And let's now have a look at what the planets have in store for us this autumn and into the early winter. Well, Mars has quite rightly stolen the show uh, in the last few months and culminating in its opposition uh, on Wednesday morning. But the event coming up towards the end of the year, the Great Conjunction, is probably a more significant uh, event, actually, for us. Um, many of you may have seen the Great Conjunction before. They occur every 20 years between Jupiter and Saturn. But this one uh, coming up at the end of the year is quite special in terms of its rarity. So the separation that we will see between Jupiter and Saturn as viewed from Earth will be at its narrowest that has been seen since the Great Conjunction of 1623. So we'll actually have the opportunity to see through a telescope um, the planets closer together in, in, in the field of view than has probably ever been observed through a telescope. So the 1623 um, conjunction we actually believe wasn't actually um, observed through the telescope so you could make history um, on the 21st of December this year and we'll discuss a bit more about that shortly. So what is a conjunction? So um, in simple terms to describe it it's a phenomenon where two bodies, two planetary bodies and in this instance uh, as viewed from the earth mark their closest approach together and that's when we determine the conjunction. There are other types of conjunction, for example, the inferior and superior solar conjunction, and we've seen those um, and discussed those in the talks earlier in the year on, on Venus. The great conjunction is a term uh, we reserve principally for the conjunction that occurs between the two giant planets of our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and the conjun conjunction of these two planets actually um, is quite infrequent compared to conjunctions of, of all the planets occurring once uh, every 20 years, or to be more precise, every 19.86 years. So why this frequency? Well, Jupiter orbits the Sun in just under 12 years, while Saturn takes much, much longer than that, uh, 29 and a half years to orbit the Sun. So Saturn keeps moving away from Jupiter in the sky until Jupiter eventually, essentially, laps Saturn. So Jupiter closes the gap um, between itself and Saturn by about 18 degrees um, per year. So it takes 20 years to make that full 360 degree orbit and catch up uh, with Saturn and that is the frequency of the Great Conjunction. So what will we see um, in the night sky on the 21st of December, which is actually the same day as the winter solstice? Well, I put a mock-up on the screen now of, of what we'll see through my telescope. So I have a Celestron C11 telescope. Um, with a, This is the view through the 40 millimeter eyepiece, which gives a magnification of about time 70 uh, in the field of view in, in, in that white ring. Um, so this is what we should expect to see. Just a bit, a bit more context on that separation will expect to get. So the separation between Jupiter and Saturn will be just six arc minutes and seven arc seconds apart. And that will be the closest approach of the two planets uh, in the night sky for, uh, since 1623. Um, so it really will be quite a rare event. If people aren't familiar with the scale of this, I'm just going to pop onto the screen um, the moon. So that will give you a bit of reference there. So the the field of view of my scope is 0 0.7 degrees. The moon's about 0 0.5 degrees across. Um, and the separation that we're going to see is 0 0.1 degrees. So that is sort of similar to the Imbrian Basin, which is shown here. So that's roughly about 0 0.1 degree um, across. So if we put that onto the uh, separation between the planets, you can kind of see for reference what that actual separation will look like um, in the sky and that should be um, resolvable to the naked eye it's going to be a challenge for a couple of reasons so um, firstly the uh, brightness of Saturn so Saturn will just be 
uh, magnitude 0.6 at sunset uh, on the 21st of December and Jupiter outshining it by magnitude minus 2.7 so that could be a challenge to resolve them because Saturn would appear 10 times fainter by then um, to Jupiter. Also the actual position in the sky so at sunset the planets are, are just three, uh, 30 degrees elongation from the sun and that's um, just after sunset at about uh, 545 GMT so the best time probably uh, to observe uh, the two is probably around uh, four o'clock in, in the evening when they certainly Jupiter should start to pop out but you've probably only got an hour and a half um, before um, the planet is set. So they'll be low down just 13 degrees above the horizon um, so the more experienced observers you might want to try and observe this during the daytime um, and we'll put the usual precautions here in when you're observing using a telescope when the sun is above the horizon to be extremely careful in doing that but that might give um, a better opportunity to to view this event but again just 13 degrees um, 30 degrees elongation from the sun so do watch out and be careful if, if you're attempting that so historically why is this um, conjunction so great well we have to go back to the 17th century to find a closer conjunction uh, to 1623 um, which is actually only a few years after the invention of the telescope which is why I mentioned earlier this event may be the closest that anyone has ever actually seen the planets through a telescope so 1623 the conjunction was the separation was five arc minutes and ten seconds so compare that to our six arc minutes and seven seconds so slightly closer um, but the actual event was very difficult to observe um, and it's likely that 1623 conjunction wasn't observed with a telescope since Galileo um, observing from Italy the two planets would only be in a degree above the horizon um, at sunset and only 13 degrees um, from the sun indeed papers written in the Royal Astronomical Society's monthly notices in 1856 and also in the Journal of the British Astronomical Association in 1896 say that the 1623 event wasn't actually observed and it's quoting there that the planets were being lost into the sunshine. So I've put together um, some slides just showing the position of uh, the conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter um, over each conjunction starting in 1623. So you can see here the two planets. Now I've centred here on Jupiter in the centre, so Jupiter will remain in the centre as we go through all of the conjunctions and you'll see that separation, or relative separation of Saturn ch change as we go through um, the conjunctions. So the first one there, uh, 1623, when I said that that separation um, was slightly closer than the one we've got uh, coming up, at just five arc minutes and ten seconds. So I'm just going to scan through now and show you the separation um, in those 20 year cycles and we can see one or two interesting um, conjunctions when one or two other planets join the party so here in 1723 Mars shows up quite close to the conjunction that can be turned a triple conjunction um, but you can see there the moon also in, in view but a very very thin phase so that shows you that Many of these conjunctions are actually difficult to, to observe because of their proximity relative to the sun. And also here's a conjunction in 1742 when the planet, um, the star Regulus makes an appearance. Again, another time it's termed a triple conjunction and many of the uh, conjunctions feature this star. Um, If we scan through to the conjunction of 1821, this is um, one of um, what's termed a triple, triple conjunction, uh, which roughly occurred about one in six of the um, great conjunctions, a, a triple conjunction. So that occurs when the Earth is on the side of its orbit that's closest to Jupiter uh, and Saturn. So a, a triple conjunction, essentially, you get the retrograde motion of the planet so Jupiter uh, can actually pass Saturn 
um, as it traverses east, then the retrograde motion kicks in uh, and they start moving in a westward direction to get the second conjunction. And then the third conjunction occurs when that retrograde motion starts the passage of the planet Jupiter eastwards again. Um, and those usually occur within the space of, of, of a year. But they're say one in six of, of, of the conjunctions are triple conjunctions and we've got that one in 1821 and also in 1940 and straight 41 and 1980 and 81. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen a great conjunction before but we've certainly got a spectacular one coming up and that's showing the view relative to all of the other conjunctions that we're likely to see. So I've just quickly put on here the most uh, narrowest separation between the planets through that central green circle and the widest separation which occurred in that 1941 conjunction and you can see the planets moving around within that circle over the 400 years of great conjunctions that I've plotted. And then finally, here I've plotted on the minimum separation of all of those great conjunctions between 1603 to 2020. So you can see the conjunction of 2020 just slightly outside that ring of the one in 1623. So conjunctions um, have historical importance. So the great conjunction of 1563 was observed by Tarko Brahe. And he measured the change in separation of the two planets uh, over a period of time. And his measurements actually what were used to enable Johannes Kepler to establish his laws of planetary motion. But looking at the minimum separation, you see, well, why is there that variation? Well, that's explained by the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, which are inclined uh, to one another with respect to the Earth. So uh, Jupiter's inclination is 1.3 degrees and Saturn 2.5 um, so that is the reason why we have this uh, range of separation at each conjunction. If they were in the same plane, then they would pass uh, directly in front of each other. Um, I thought well, that was quite interesting. Would uh, Jupiter ever occult Saturn? Um, looking back through history, difficult question to answer. The, probably the closest to that happening um, that we can be confident about was 1793 BC, when the separation was just 1.5 arc minutes. So remember, this year it's just a little over six. Uh, and this was actually classed as a naked eye merge of the planet. So you couldn't resolve the separation uh, of the two. So it was classed as a naked eye merge, but it wasn't actually um, an occultation. Difficult one to answer, and I've had a look online. Um, and I think the general consensus is the ephemeral data that a lot of the planetariums are based on uh, to calculate this are really dubious when you go far enough out uh, for this event to occur. Um, but here it is anyway uh, in the year uh, 11,663 BC. And here it does show that we had an occultation event uh, with Jupiter occulting Saturn. So whether that actually happened, not quite sure, but I thought it was interesting just to show that. So it really will be an event to keep your eyes out for um, over the coming months, really, into December. Um, and hopefully we'll all manage to get a few images uh, of this event. Um, fingers crossed for clear skies on the 21st of December. So we'll move now into questions and Julian and James are going to join me in again. Um, so do submit those on the YouTube live chat. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Um, some people in the chat are saying they want a live broadcast um, for the, the Great Conjunction. Now, what time did you say it's actually closest? Well, it's probably um, best to get it around about um... Four o'clock, I think, when it's highest in the sky. I think the actual closest is um, six o'clock. Right. So it might have been just about setting by then. Okay. Well, I have checked my diary and I'm currently not meant to be at work. So um, we can have a go. 
Um, but we'll see what happens. Right, so there's been some chat on the chat thing. Um, for those who can't see the chat, I can summarise. In fact, Julian, you can do the first one which came in, which was John's question of what's a PFF? Yes, uh, so I put some quick notes in there. So it's actually a PSF, point spread function. So it's um, a way of mathematically um, modeling how the light from a single point would spread out across um, the CCD or the photographic plate of old times. And so if you know exactly how that works, so it, it's sort of you know, it's typically very bright in the center and then it sort of slowly decays across. So if you can model that quite well, then you can work out where the center of the star is uh, from looking at that. All telescopes have slightly different PSFs and um, you know, some of them have quite extreme ones. The binocular telescopes, for instance, are uh, the giant the binocular is much wider than it is tall, so it has a, a quite a stretched PSF. It's it's not a circular one, it's a sort of more elliptical. But anyway, if you're you're looking at large concentrations of stars that are almost overlapping each other, you need to be able to uh, sort of untangle them and that's that's kind of the maths behind it. Right. Um, Chris Stokes has said uh, a lyre is, has a bridge supporting the strings. The strings of a harp pass directly into the body of the instrument. So it's nothing to do with the shape. It's, it's this bridge. Ah, so it, it sounds like a... Much wiser then. Yeah. Um, so Chris S has said... Uh, how big's the bubble? So I had a quick look online and it's somewhere between seven and ten light years across. So that's... Um, Big old beast then. Yeah. Twice the distance of Earth to the nearest star. So it's pretty big. Um, and I also read that the star is offset from the centre, from the, the symmetry of the bubble itself. Um but I couldn't find, whilst reading, a reason for that. Julian, do you know? I don't know. No, that, that does seem a bit uh, strange. Sometimes you, uh, the, the sort of uh, outflowing gas hits uh, another structure and that, that kind of stops it, but I don't know <clears> in this case. Um, extra features. Very interesting talk. Thank you. So Julian also said that... I, it, is a star shared by two constellations? I don't think so. I think the last one, which probably was, was um, that star in Andromeda and um, Pegasus. Um, but that got divided up by the IAU when they defined their constellations. But there, there might be one. I don't know. People can write in. Um, I always want to say GQT, Gardener's Question Time, <laughs> but we're not. It's the wrong show. Wrong show. Um, don't ask us about your geraniums. No. Um, so what else? Lara Live Broad. That's all I've written down from the live chat so far. Um, someone's thanking us because it engaged their kids. That's good. That is what we're here for. Yeah. Um, so it is. It looks pretty dark outside from my window. Has anyone looked to see how clear it is or not? I, I could see Mars about half an hour ago. It looked pretty, oh, pretty good. Great. But I That's think the good. forecast as the evening night gets on looks pretty cloudy. Right. Trouble with these more autumnal winter nights is they get a lot colder, don't they? Mm. I think one thing we've been looking at the last couple of days is the jet stream. So I think the clear nights we've had recently, the jet stream has been right overhead. So for the next couple of nights, the jet stream's weakened over, overhead of us. So that might be a better time to try and actually do some, some imaging. But unfortunately, I don't think the clouds are going to play ball. So if you get the chance tonight, take it to do some imaging of Mars. Uh, I don't know if Roy, if he's listening, our journal editors asked for people to send any images they managed to take of uh, Mars during this uh, apparition to him so he can publish them in a, a special journal edition um, either for November or, or December. So if you get any good images, do send them in to, to Roy. 
Um, Sh Shirley's asked what constellation the bubble nebula is in. Richard, can you get Stellarium up and uh, share yeah. the screen? Um, so Shirley, it's in Cassiopeia. Um, I can see it on my Stellarium, but we'll just wait for Richard to uh, boot. Oh. Can you share your screen, actually, because my Stellarium doesn't work? Um, yeah. He says, share screen. So is that showing? Yep. So um, we've got Cassiopeia here, the W on the side. And if you follow the, the right two stars there to there, and it comes up to, there's the Dormouse cluster. Um, it comes up to the bubble nebula, which is there. And if we zoom in, there's a little image um, of that bubble nebula. And apparently William Herschel discovered it in 17 something, which is remarkable. Um, just shows how good his eyes were and his, and his optics and his night sky. Um, I have to say, I've never looked. I've never even tried to look at it naked eye, but we will have a go. Yeah. Um, and the bubble nebula has got various names. It's in the, the Coldwell catalogue C11. Um, it's also in the new general catalogue, and it's in the Sharpless catalogue as well, as well as these other two. And the Sharpless catalogue's one that Lee's very interested in. It's a I think mostly hydrogen alpha targets. Um, and so that they are rich in um, hydrogen alpha uh, and they're, they're very nice targets for astrophotographers. Um, so what else has happened on the chat? Richard, you can have the screen back if you want. Um, Herbal's happy that there's some objects he could look at. That's good. Um, the bubble will be a challenge from a light polluted area, um, but certainly um, the ring nebula will be visible. Uh, will there be a star party in 2021? Who knows? Who knows? We're waiting with bated breath as to what will happen. Julian, this could be one for you from Stuart Porteous. What might the effect of a of supernovae be on life on Earth? Some of the giants are relatively close, I believe. Yeah, I don't think any of them are really close enough to be a hazard. I think the nearest one is probably Betelgeuse at about 400 and something light years. I think it's something like that. It might be 600, somewhere around there. But uh, anyway, there's, there's none that are really particularly close. Uh, so there will just be a, uh, a fascinating object to watch rather than um, uh, run for your life sort of thing. So uh, if, if they were much closer, they, they could potentially do some damage. Uh, so they give off all sorts of nasty radiation, gamma rays and x-rays and things like that. So uh, if they're too close, then that, that would be quite concentrated. But uh, most of the ones that we know about are a, a good distance away. So uh, just interesting to watch rather than ending all life on Earth. And, and does the explosion spread out in all directions equally? Or is it like are there jets or a disk? Uh, that's a good question. So um, most people think they sort of explode um, just just in all directions, but uh, that's not always the case. I think uh, in some cases they can uh, sort of uh, blow up asymmetrically and uh, the, the resulting neutron star or whatever goes shooting out uh, as a result of it. It's like a sort of a, a sideways explosion or something like that. Mm. So uh, that's something they're actually looking for with gravitational wave detectors. Uh, because if you get one of these asymmetric explosions, then it would give off gravitational waves and they could uh, theoretically detect it. Although, not knowing about, not 
knowing very much about uh, the detailed science of it, I have my doubts as whether you can uh, separate that from the general random noise of things happening in the universe. Right. John said, well, uh, question whether Alnath is shared between Taurus and Auriga. Um, well, I've had a look and it's Beta Tauri and it seems it's in Taurus, but clearly is on the border of um, it. It had the coexisting name of Gamma Auriga. Well, well, we'll have to research that. We'll put it in the journal, John. We'll contact the IAU, <laughs> the nomenclature department, yeah. and get them to check that. Send them a telegram. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think John's got a telex machine at home. You can. <laughs> uh, uh, so Rob, <laughs> Rob Bush asked about the um, camera and stuff for Lee's image of the elephant nebula. Um, elephant trunk and Lee said it was an attic 460 EX hydrogen alpha filter uh, with an ED80 scope and processed in PixInsight. Uh, and Fred says it's clear. Jeremy, talking about the Coldwell catalogue, Jeremy says December marks the 25th anniversary of the Coldwell catalogue. And that's in maybe the December Sky and Telescope. So there's something about that in in the next sky and telescope. Um, and that's it. I think we're up to date with the questions. If it is clear, I'm hoping we can, well, I'm hoping I can have a, a quick look at Mars. Yep. If the seeing is good. Have you checked the jet stream, Richard? Have you, have you got the jet stream map you can share? Uh, not at the moment. I think it should be clear, though. Do you want me to find the jet stream map? There we go. It's not too bad tonight. OK, yeah. That was at 12 o'clock. Can you fast forward it to sort of nine midnight? Okay, this, this is midnight. Okay. Still missing us. Yeah. In fact, there might be a little patch of good over the east of England, which might just include us. Nice. Yeah. So John said, not a telex. I remember working on a Mufax machine. <laughs> and then Jeremy said, Alnath was assigned exclusively to tourists by the IAU in 1930. I don't think Jeremy was at that meeting, but um, Isn't he? he's a no. Very high cloud has come over Keyworth. So a little bit of cloud, often uh, mist and cloud um, is often not a problem for planetary. Um, and in fact, it's some, a little bit of mist sometimes signifies that the seeing actually is going to be okay. I don't know why. Um, right. So I think I think that's it. I think we've exhausted the questions and, and also. need a cup of tea. <laughs> Julian and Richard, I'm very grateful. And Lee, I'm grateful to you for your work behind the scenes and everyone else to their images. Um, I haven't got a clue what next plum tree is going to be. It's there on the screen. Next plum tree. Where is it? Oh, there. Penny yeah. and Peach. Oh, that's the main meeting. Yes. Oh, oh, the next plum tree. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. No, we don't know. Any uh, suggestions, anybody? Yes. Um, let us know. Uh, but yes, 
that's it from me. I don't know if Richard's got anything to say. Just very quickly, yeah, the same NAS members um, have been sent a copy of our first ever newsletter. So uh, this we thought would be a good way to uh, communicate with members during uh, the lockdown and we can't meet face to face. So you should, uh, all the members should have received that via email. So please, please do take a look at that and uh, send us any feedback and comments to the stuff we've discussed in there. So you should all, all have had that earlier in the week. Um, so, yeah, as James mentioned, our next main meeting um clashes with bonfire night so thursday the 5th of november so um to tempt you away from that we pulled out all the stops damien peach is going to be joining us uh for the annual prestigious lecture and that's going to be on high resolution astrophotography so do make sure you tune in then usual time eight o'clock so um yeah so from all of us thank you for watching and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time good night good night